Hello there. Greetings. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good day, whatever it may be for you where you're listening. This is your host, Tony Anderson, the Cabin on the Rocks podcast. On today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things I was doing before I picked up a guitar, started writing songs. I was a painter, artwork, painting, mostly watercolor, predominantly, and printmaking. And uh, back in 1989, I want to say, started living in Malibu, California, uh, for almost three years. Thanks to a girlfriend, Lisa, at the time. Hi, Lisa. So, uh, it was straight up east from Zuma 7, uh, up behind the occupational school in Malibu. You used to be able to cut through the school and walk some trails, drop out the end of this cul-de-sac out there where, I li- out there where I, we lived in a huge home that was owned by two brain surgeons. They had a couple different tenants there too. A two-story huge place maybe on a couple acres. It's pretty wild. Chickens running around in the kitchen on the Saltillo Mexican floor tiles and whatnot. Never a dull moment over there. So, but we had a guest a guest house room or whatever you want to call it with its own facilities and entrance, and we used that and had house privileges and stuff too. So we still could survive. And it was at the an, uh, incredible low price of three hundred dollars a month. Imagine living in Malibu, California for almost three years, $300 a month. Fantastic. So pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Well, what, what happened to me was, uh, I had several jobs in town. Um, neither my girlfriend or I had a car for different reasons, but, uh, I was spending all my time on artwork when I wasn't working and painting and now it led me to selling my artwork door to door, and I started off selling it Point Doom, and I went clear all the way to Trancas, which, if you know the area of Malibu, uh, I think it goes up to like 13 or 14 life lifeguard towers uh, going north, and Trancas is uh, kind of the edge, uh, one of the edges of the northern boundaries there of Malibu, and Anyways, um, I went to every house I could until Point Doom to Trancus was full. And it took about six months. Every day I'd just set out on foot. And uh, depending on what happened during the day and how long, maybe I stopped at whatever house. Um, then I'd just pick up the next day where I left off. Uh, generally, back-to-back days. Most most times, more than not. And I had uh, got into... Uh, Ooh, probably nine out of ten houses, uh, at least to talk to people, uh, and really well received. I mean, at the time, I was in my teen years there, just uh, 18, 19, uh, 19 that would have been. So, and um, I looked like Richie Cunningham, uh, All-American, uh, squeaky clean, uh, short, red hair, and Eagle Scout, making the rounds. I had uh, something my girlfriend's uh, grandfather had made uh, to help her with her artwork, a portfolio. It was two big pieces of cold press board with a Velcro strap. And I took all, I took my original, some original paintings, and I would have those displayed on the inside of these two pieces of cold press when you hit the Velcro strap and open them up. And I made a sleeve on the outside, too, for prints. So people couldn't afford an original. I had prints to accommodate budget so anyways i would knock on the door and when they would open the door i would have the uh, cold press portfolio open uh with both hands like a giant greeting card you know reversed open up showing them my original artwork so they'd be seeing the artwork immediately without anything saying hello i'm a local artist selling my own work would you be interested in any and you know then i'd go in to talk about my process and what what all i did and where it was and Got to say, it was a very good reception. We were very well received. Many adventures, many stories. Um, and one of them, which is probably more uh, memorable, uh, the 
places I went to and houses I got into was Bob Dylan's house. And I think uh, going through most of the neighborhood at Point Doom area, I had maybe reached all the homes by maybe, I think, two and a half week period. Two and a half weeks, I went through the neighborhood. And uh, so I did pretty well. A lot of, uh, you know, Malibu was just the right kind of community at the time. That and the way I looked and selling artwork. I mean, I'm sure if I was selling vacuum cleaners, it wouldn't have been received hardly as warmly, you know, nearly as warmly and receptive. And uh, so, anyways, I uh, I got to the point where I knew I was kind of getting close to Bob's house, and I asked a couple people, eh, you know, this very I didn't want to appear like you know a stalker or anything, you know, which I certainly was not and am not. And uh, but uh, I would say at the end of a uh, if I had some kind of exchange or someone bought some art or something, I would kind of end with, oh, by the way, hey, is is Bob Dylan's house around here? And many of the people were like, no, uh, I don't know. No, I don't know, even though I'm sure they did know. But it was kind of like, hey, we live here. We're not, even though I live there too. But um, they weren't giving it up. They weren't going to tell. So, uh, And then other people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's right there. It's down there. Da, da, da. So I kept getting these, like, signals, like, closer, closer. And so finally I got a guy who was a couple doors down from Bob's house, uh old Italian guy wearing a wife beater, smoking a cigar, washing his car. And he didn't want to buy any artwork. But then I said, oh, yeah, is Bob, Bob Dylan's house around here? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a, just a couple doors down. It looks like a broken down car lot. You can't miss it. A rickety bamboo fence. Okay. So I think, wow, today's the day. I'm actually going to go to Bob's house and see what happens. So. I'm walking up the street. I see the description, uh, the property that the that the neighbor explained, and I figured, oh, this this looks like the place. And it was a big, I don't know, geez, maybe I want to say 600 yard uh, f- property front and a big. Oh, I guess I didn't know at the time, but on the e- on the east and western borders of the property were these big sliding gates chain link with this little inexpensive bamboo or tan type uh, fencing on the inside of the chain link and uh, I think the main entrance uh, is uh, further west so I came up on the back side the west side of the property and the fence gate was locked but right next to the fence gate that slid open was two posts like six feet apart and all the chain link was cut out it was completely open and i said hmm i look in there i see a boat the boat's got some name on it like our nation our father our country is one of those three something like that i remember and i think to myself <clears throat> well i could look at this two ways i could look at this like a door or I could look at this like a hole. There's a hole here in this fence, and this is a hole, and she didn't walk in here. And, or I could say, well, this is a door. So being pretty resilient and fearless, I decided to look at it like it's a door. And I'm going to walk in and announce myself and try to sell some artwork like I've been doing at every other house in the neighborhood. So I walk past the boat. I come on these, I don't see anybody, I'm saying hello, hello, I'm announcing myself, I like look through some trees and I see some Mexican uh, laborers doing some brickwork somewhere in the yard and they just kind of looked at me like, who are you, what are you doing, but they didn't even say anything and bother me and uh, they were like 50 feet away, I just waved and um, then I came across these like, this little shack that was like four by eight plywood and it had these little cobblestones leading up into the shack and I looked at the each side of the shack was painted a different color it was like psychedelic but it was a solid color like one piece of four by eight was green one four by eight side of the roof was pink one four by eight was orange blue you know subtle colors and just cut out window and 
<clears throat> walking up the whole time announcing hello hello I look in this little shack there's kind of like this old school type prison cot <clears throat> portable camping cot springs metal frame springs and <clears throat> a bed there's like a notebook a notebook sitting on this bed and some a pen some writing I didn't even look at the writing I didn't go in the shack I just looked through the cutout window and and there was like a remote control 4x4 four four stomper truck with a, I remember that too. It was just sitting there with the notebook and stuff. So I look and I don't disturb and I don't try and read anything or pry or I just continue on with my purpose, which is trying to sell some artwork and meet Bob, hopefully, maybe, you know, thinking, hey, this could be good for my art, you know. If he becomes a fan, this could lead to good things. So <laughs> imagination, everything starts with an idea. So. I finally come to a clearing and come out uh, to what is really the first of many guard shacks on the property. This would be the first, you know, main guard shack that is kind of the uh, hub of, you know, processing whoever might come to the property. And these dogs start barking, uh, you know, who later I become to know who their names are Hero and, and I forget the other one's name, a German Shepherd and... Um, and uh, I just remember, it's a weird story, but that, that, like I went to the house several times later. I kind of became friends with some of the people there that worked there. And, uh, this dog hero, you'd throw a cup of coffee in the air, it would jump and it would drink the coffee and just it would latch onto the stream of coffee in midair. And, but this was my first visit here, and I put my hands out to the dog, and I went down low, and you know, he sniffed me out. And, somehow got in and the guy I'm start talking to this guy who were his initials are BK we'll just call him Bob and uh, I say hello I'm a local artist on my own work and I came in through the door back there he said oh you mean the hole I said a whole door I don't know you and I say but you know I live right here in the area and I'm a local artist on my own work uh, now, this guy, by the way, he looks like he just dropped off the 1969 Creedence Clearwater record. He's got Georgia boots on, uh, 501s, uh, beard, uh, uh, Buddy Holly glasses, and he's looking pretty 1969. And so uh, this guy says, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Well, he looks, uh, looks pretty cool. He was really into the artwork. He was a pretty nice guy about it all. And so. I, he says, oh, yeah, yeah, sit on down. So I sit down in this guard shack, and he kicks his Georgia boots up. And uh, after he opens a small fridge and pulls out these uh, designer uh, designer uh, carbonated uh, drinking waters uh, and asks me, oh, do you want one? Oh, yeah, thanks. And uh, he then at the time I smoked, he has a cigarette. Oh, he offers me a cigarette. Would you like one? Oh, sure. So I'm having uh, some uh, designer bottled waters and cigarettes now at the uh, – at the guard shack with Bob. And uh, he tells me how he lives on the property with his wife. And his wife's an artist, and he thinks it's really cool what I'm doing, and he likes my artwork. And we talk for a while. Oh, and the first thing that he do is ask for my ID. So I'm wanting to be totally um, uh, cooperative, of course. You know, see, so I'm trying to get as far as I can here. And take my ID and they log all my details down in this book and and I remember for whatever we talked about uh, I talked about everything but Bob I didn't mention Bob I didn't make any inclination that I was looking for Bob's house I didn't say but you know I kind of was well I was going to every house to sell artwork anyways and I just knew he was a resident and I thought mm, one day I will hit his house too and that's how it happened when I just kind of came up to when his house came up in the track of houses I went to that particular day, that's the day I went to Bob's house. So, and uh, so after like an hour, I finally can't take it anymore, and I say, actually, I, I try to say it as nonchalantly relaxed, no pretense as possible. Is this um, Bob Dylan's house, by the way? He says, "Oh, Bob Dylan." Oh, that's a good friend of mine. I grew up with him. Knew him real well. Know him real well. Yeah. I my eyes widen. Oh, this guy just confirms his Bob's house and that Bob. He's telling me he's a good friend. And I said, Oh, so really? This is this is Bob's house. 
And he says, who? I say, Bob, Bob, Bob Dylan. And he says, lots of people come here looking for such person. I got to tell him there's no one here by that name. So I have an aha moment. Oh, okay, this guy now. I'm kind of cornering him. He just kind of admitted it was, and then I ask a second time, and he, you know, he's going with the kind of stock necessary reply he has to go by. And so, and right when he says that, you know, lots of people come here look for such person. Got to tell him there's no one here by that name. I turn around, and for the last hour. I had not turned around and looked at the wall in the guard shack right behind me where I was sitting because my back was against the wall. And on this wall, wallpaper covered the wall, was all these Polaroid pictures. There were all these photos of all these people who came to see Bob. Some of them were handcuffed to the fence, chained. They all had notes on them, considered dangerous, bipolar, wants to see BD. They had all these notes written on them and stuff turn around and look at the guy I say wow I say wow that's all I say he goes yeah we would have took your picture too but we, we ran out of film in the camera so I leave it alone I have another couple cigarettes a couple more bottled waters talk for maybe another 30 minutes <laughs> the guy says yeah come on back if you want it's cool you can visit but don't tell your friends don't tell your friends and just you know uh, I said oh all right Okay, well, so uh, I didn't get in to see Bob, but uh, and then uh, well, there were times when I was in Point Dune selling artwork, I'd stop by from time to time, and I met a couple of other people that worked at the property, the girl who did the grocery shopping, the guy who did some of the groundskeeping, and knew the dogs, you know, that were there, and, and uh that same week was uh, pretty amazing because I actually got invited into both of his neighbors' homes. They both bought artwork from me, originals. One of them was a older woman. His direct neighbor was an older woman at the time, probably in her 70s. She's probably passed. I think her name was Alice. Her husband was a furniture builder, custom furniture. And they'd lived in this property before Bob and she was super nice and invited me in, looked at my artwork, ended up buying one of my clowns. The clown series was very popular. You can uh, see all the artwork I'm talking about here, too, over at uh, DeviantArt.com, Deviant, D-E-V-I-A-N-T. It's uh, uh, Fast Tony Anderson on DeviantArt.com. It's linked off the podcast website, uh, Cabin-Podcast.com. At the very bottom, there are links to all the social media, and you can find the artwork link there too so and she's looking at the clown she buys a clown it might have been a salmon clown a green clown or had different colors whatever i did you know i picked these um realistic subjects and i would capture the silhouettes the borders the outlines of realistic subject matter and then i would kind of fill in the interiors with this kind of almost baltic or fractal type uh, color bleeding technique with watercolor on uh, acetate that accepts wet media and would put these fabric linen mattings behind them. Every job I worked at, I always used scraps. I was worked as a picture framer. I had mat boards and picture frames and sign maker. I had vinyl scraps, making artwork with vinyl and printmaking stencils, silkscreen stencils with vinyl and whatever I could do. Anyway, so that was sometime later, but... um. Alice is super nice, and I bring up Bob. This so, oh, it's it's over there at Bob's house. She said, "Oh, Bob's house. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't know why people make such a fuss over that guy. When he moved here, we had all kinds of strange people coming up to our house, knocking on our door all the time, offering us money, want to just come in, take pictures from our backyard. People hanging out over, how helicopters flying over just to get pictures of the property." She said, "Oh, who needs it? You know, whatever." And just. Sound like it's probably kind of a bit of a nuisance being Bob's neighbor, maybe at some points, especially the next door neighbor. But um, I remember talking to her uh, at the time. I hadn't picked the guitar yet, but I was a writer, poems mostly, and those later became a lot of songs. And uh, But I remember her telling me, um, she sensed I had some uh, admiration for his work and his writing. And she told me, you should find yourself a new hero. You, he's never done any good for anybody you know, I was really, whoa, okay, I didn't agree, I didn't disagree, I just kind of took it in, oh, okay, yeah, and then, so, 
those were her. She she had some other stories too, but I'll leave them alone. I'll just leave that there. And um, but uh, the other neighbor across the street was a famous actor who's on a uh, Barney Miller TV show. And you couldn't see in this property at all. It was like a lot of Malibu properties. It was pretty secluded and uh, pretty closed. You you know, I remember it had like 15 foot tall wood fencing completely around the property. It had this one kind of, I almost want to call it like a castle type door. It was a rounded door at the top, you know, it a, and it had a porthole in it and I stuck my head in the porthole. And I see this man reading a newspaper and a little kid on a swing set swinging. And I just shout through the porthole, hello, I'm a local artist selling my own work. Would you be interested in any? He kind of turns stunned like nobody gets through this fortress this guy has here probably very often. But except some local Richie Cunningham looking artist kid sticking his head through a porthole. And... He says, uh, well, I'll take a look at it, but it doesn't mean I'm going to buy any. And I remember right away, I said, well, you won't know how much you like it until you see one. <laughs> and so he invites me in. I show him uh, the one painting. He says, I want to see them all. He's totally transfixed and, and invites me in, and I show him all my artwork. He buys a clown. It's a big weekend for clowns, so... And uh, he says, hey, my wife, my kids, they're artists. I want them to meet you. I want them to see what you're doing and meet you because I think it's really interesting what you're doing, how you're going about around. And Oh, okay. I said, well, I don't have a car, and I like to get home before dark. I said, hey, I'll give you a ride home. Don't worry about it. If you can go, uh, you can come back about 5 o'clock. Uh, my wife will be home. I want her to meet you. I said, well, you know what? I have enough houses to go visit. that I could be out selling artwork till 5 and coming back. So I did that. And. When I came back, um, I came in the house, and uh, there was a little girl. I remember a little uh, mulatto, mulatto girl, and she has gluing, gluing some macaroni on some black construction paper uh, for something she was working on. Saying, this is her hair. This man, this famous actor, he sat there, uh, has a little, little, little newborn uh, baby, uh, uh, maybe not even a year old, in a high chair right next to him. He's got an apron on. He's at the stove. He's making quesadillas. Hey, Tony, you want a quesadilla? I said, oh, sure. How about some coffee? Oh, that'd be great. He wants some chicken in that quesadilla. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I say, you know, just amazing. So anyways, I have a nice dinner with his family. His wife and... and uh, comes home and do a little spiel presentation, show my stuff. So it was pretty. It was pretty cool. It was exciting. It was a nice reception, and it was a good weekend there. Going to Bob's house and his neighbors, showing some artwork. So, but that was just one of the stories. I gotta say though that when I look at this collection of photographs and the guard shack, uh, I remember having the feeling like, gosh, you know, Bob Dylan just. It looked like the collection of. Just some of the most wayward, uh, desolate, uh, just like, <sighs> I started thinking Bob, Bob Dylan's music is like the soundtrack to uh, a segment of the global population that could represent a faction of just totally dropped out of society, mainstream cut out of the machine type people. I like looking at these pictures and their faces and their eyes. It was just like, wow. I mean, some of them were straight crazy stalkers, you know, for sure. You could see that. And I remember them saying, uh, oh, this one lady was handcuffed to the fence. He's like, yep, this lady comes every year, brings flowers for his birthday. He never gets them, never sees them, never sees anything. None of it ever gets to him. I mean, bother. And another kid who worked at the property had told me um, he'd worked there almost two years. He said, you know, I've never even seen Bob. He said, I'm, I'm sorry, he didn't say he never said him. He said he's never even talked to Bob. He said he's grunted at me a couple times, but um, never even had a conversation with him. And uh, I just remember that um, – it was uh, interesting that at the end of the living in Malibu, almost uh, three years later, in like my last month of living in Malibu, I was at Mayfair Market in Point Doom, and 
here's BK from Bob's house. Hey, Tony. He says, uh, what are you doing? I, I have a job opening at the property at the house in one of the guard tracks. Are you, are you, would you be interested? I think you'd be a good fit. You'd be, you know, want to work. Uh, thinking, wow, I'm going to get a job at Bob's house. Well, unfortunately, he didn't know, but the time in Malibu was coming to a close. I had made the decision to move to Oregon, and this is right in between, uh, you know, starting to play in guitar and going down to Venice Beach Boardwalk four days a week, uh, which is kind of where my rather lengthy bio picks up uh, at uh, cabin-podcast.com, meet the meet the host section on the webpage. I have a pretty long bio there, but um, that is one of the um, tales there. So that kind of pre predates my predates my music and uh, when I was a painter and just writing poems and things like that before they turn into songs. So pretty exciting. All right. Well, next up, I have some uh, Buskers, more Buskers tales. Uh, this time from Austin, Texas. So join me. And welcome back to Cabin on the Rocks podcast. This is your host, Tony Anderson. Going to go talk about some uh, busker stories, and this time in Austin, Texas, uh, 1995, March 1995, with $500 and a guitar and a backpack, I got on a train. Sounds like a song, huh? But in many songs. <laughs> and uh, made my way to Austin, Texas, not knowing anybody. Except the brother of a friend I went to school with, uh, Aaron. Aaron Buckles, uh, shout out. Thank you very much. Gave me a place to stay. Picked me up from the train station. Uh, though I was only at his house for about five days because uh, I realized he lived just too far out and I had to get uh, closer to the action. Uh, so I uh, ultimately I went, I think the area was called Oak Hill and uh, it's it was like a 45-minute uh, bus ride, it seemed like, uh, to get to downtown and the college and 6th Street and all that. I went, wow, okay, I got to get uh, I gotta get to where it's a little more happening here uh, for a, a, a biped uh, with a guitar. So I uh, ended up renting a room with a family right behind Wheatsville Co-op off Guadalupe, just above the drag there. Uh, so you could walk a back fence from the Wheatsville Co-op. It's literally to this house where I rented a room upstairs. So for a few months, just long enough to uh, get enough money saved to get an apartment, um, which I did quickly. I like a lot of times I moved around. I'd get a job as a waiter and uh, work as many hours as I had to work to get the rent, uh, to get an apartment, to get deposit. And I used, uh, I remember I used um, four of my $500 to move into this room and then I had $100 just to float by on until I made enough money and tips to move out, which I did uh, shortly after, within a couple months for sure. Uh, but, um, uh, but anyways, uh, as usual, it was time to get, uh, get uh, collecting some votes in the case, and I went out and surveyed and started playing. Uh, first places I played were like coffee shops, Rudamaya, and other places there are. Songwriters just falling out of trees in Austin, Texas. So it was like, wow, my mind was just blown. I was like, okay, I've picked a good spot here to land. 1995 is a pretty different Austin, Texas than I think what it's now. It's just just uh, just huge. It was still a good sized city with small town roots back then. Um, so it was really, really just. And amazing. So I have so many just fantastic friends uh, that to this day. And it's the only place I'm not from uh, where I was treated like family. So I mean, so much. I mean, I've never treated like family, I and mean, to a greater degree, it's some place I wasn't from than Austin, Texas. So big shout out, love, Lone Star State. So uh, I remember uh, Austin, Texas, finding Sixth Street to be 
uh, just this, you know, crazy street live music, like a carnival nonstop atmosphere. I mean, people from the college just loading up Sixth Street on the weekends until they're all hours of the morning and. It's most, uh, you know, like it says on the back of your utility bill, it used to, it used to Austin, uh, the live capital music of the world. So uh, every other was like a bar, a venue, a both, uh, just so much entertainment, every other place, live music cranking out everywhere. So quite chaotic, hard to be heard, though I found quickly that at the very entrance of 6th Street, one of the entrances off of Congress Avenue there, right across from the historic Driscoll Hotel, there was another stoop with a floodlight. This is like a pattern here for me. I find these spots where there's a floodlight, a stoop, a built-in stage. It was an AT&T phone store. And they were closed at night. It had a light on. It had this little alcove. It made perfect... Um, uh, echo chamber, so it's fantastic. I just quickly found this spot and said, "Oh, this is just incredible." So I'm setting up to play. I'm playing, and uh, security guard walks up. Uh, African American security guard says, uh, "Excuse me, uh, you can't play here." Basically, in short, so he. Just totally shuts me down. I try to play the, I'm just a struggling artist, and this is like the preferred uh, avenue, uh, venue for performance. I have the best connection with people in the street, and the guy's not having it. He's got his job. He's a uh, official. He's to the letter. He's to the T. He's like, no, uh -uh, ain't happening. So I wasn't thwarted. I went off and played at a noisier part of 6th Street, which was self-defeating. I mean, it's hard enough getting people's ear on the street then competing with outside noise like just you're done you might as well just pack it in so well i remember i had to fix this i was like there's gotta be a solution here so i'm um, thinking like everything like all good things right starts with a good idea i decide to put on my go get a job clothes uh oxford shirt yellow short sleeve with uh you know, belt tucked in. We're looking like we're ready for some business. I walk in very politely, professionally, uh, receptionist at the desk at the AT&T store during the day. I introduce myself as a local artist uh, that uh, I find uh, my favorite choice of venue tends to be the street. And uh, the unbelievable, perfect, absolute spot on this entire street. Happens to be right smack on the doorstep of this year's store. And how I was denied by a security guard employed by the store to perform at the venue. Oh, I'm calling it a venue, but it was my venue in my mind. So, And I asked her, is there any way at all I could talk with the owner of this building? I'd like to submit permission to perform my songs here i'm totally respectful there's never any drinking or drugs and i don't let people sit around and drink or do drugs or anything in front while i'm performing I clean up the trash everything's always you know uh nothing but uh bringing a positive aspect to the uh, you know what i'm my my whole trip what i'm doing i'm not doing anything to uh you know paint a black eye on the on the situation so anyways uh, I call up this woman or I go back in the very next day following. I can't remember which, but uh, I go back and to my surprise, she says, I've spoken to the owners. I explained to them you and your arrival and what you spoke to me about and how you presented it. And they agreed. And I got this letter for you that uh, I think I had requested it. If they approve it and gave me permission, if I could get a letter, so I have some proof that I'm allowed to perform there. So, lo and behold, this is fantastic. On the AT&T letterhead, this says uh, Tony Anderson. This is the owner of this building, and this Tony Anderson has permission by us, the owners of this building, to perform here in the evenings, um, as long as you like. It's fantastic. I thought, wow, we're really on something now. So, of course, I'm out there that night, probably. And here comes the security guard in the first song in short order. Uh, hey, he's like, you're going to be a problem, I can tell. He's looking at me like, ugh, this guy? What, I just told you. I just, 
and I say, hey, we're going to be friends. You know, I'm Tony Anderson. I was yet to be fast Tony, but that's coming up soon. So, and uh, I hand him the letter. I just reach down in my case. I get the letter out, and I just hand it to him. I don't say anything. He opens the letter. He reads it. He folds it back up. He hands it back to me. He extends his hand. He says, thank you very much. You have a good evening. <sighs> Eureka. Victory. Loving it. So I perform now in this spot, and I'm feeling like, wow, this is fantastic. I've got permission to play here. This is right when people come into 6th Street. It's still quiet down here. I haven't hit the king playing at his base outside the uh, venue that he played across the street a couple blocks down, up, I think, after Brazos. I think that's where it was. I that's well, kind of foggy now, remembering a little bit, but that's... So I'm out. Uh, I'm, I, this becomes a very hot spot for me for the whole year and a half I'm living there. And when I come back again in 2003, I go back and play there again. And this is just a great spot. And I'm always playing at this spot. And luckily, no one ever bumps into me and moves into this spot. And the security guard later... We have a great rapport. Hey, Tony. He'd say whenever he saw people dancing, he'd say to me later, I saw you out here holding church tonight again. <laughs> it was great. It's just his way of saying this. You were bringing it. So it was nice. So. Well, there's this one day I'm out there playing, and this guy, like 60-plus older, kind of stocky white guy, He's a harmonica player. He's from New Orleans. Nolans. He says, um, oh, real cool. Yeah, you're playing out here. That sounds good. Yeah, you sound real good. You know, you're doing great. And, uh, I say, oh, yeah, my case is, you know, full of votes. You know, things are looking green. Really good. Uh, the guy says, oh, that's fantastic. I say, yeah, this is my favorite. This is my spot. I play here all the time. Love to play here. And I don't get too uh, crazy about my spot. But I say, you know, that's just, I play here every, every weekend and sometimes during the week, but usually on the weekends. And, you know, and so, fantastic. And I've been telling him how long I've been playing in this spot. And I faithfully come back to this spot and play here all the time. So the next night I go to perform. I roll up early. Usually I get there by 8 p.m., play till the bars close after 2 a.m. And uh, there's a harmonica player right in the spot playing. I look at the guy. Oh, shoot, I think. Come on, dude. Are you going to – is this happening? You're going to just – we just had this conversation. I was just turning you on to this stuff. Oh, this is a great spot, and I – I sold it too well. He could, this guy takes the spot. Boom, he's there. He's there before. I think he's like floating on a weekend, uh, you know, uh, from New Orleans, so just hanging out in Austin, uh, staying somewhere. I don't know. The guy's already on the. Sh the guy seems to be on the street a lot. He's out there. And funny enough, uh, later, a, a year and a half, two years, I moved to New Orleans, and I'm, I see him um, playing harmonica on the street in the French Quarter, and. I just made eye contact with him. I looked at him. And I don't even know if he recognized me, but I knew who that was. I remember this guy. I saw him. And uh, anyways, <clears throat> I'm like sitting there like, wow, I can't believe this guy just snaked my spot. Uh, I have a cigarette. Okay, I'll just kill some time here. I'll try to like wait it out. This is not going good. It's not going anywhere. This guy's not going to pack it up. This guy's not caving to me, parking my butt five feet away, smoking cigarettes back to back, waiting, thinking this guy's going to, like, move on and let me have my coveted spot that I so cherished and had, like, celebrated and celebrated a little too well, probably. Lesson learned. So, but, um,. The guy even says, like, too bad, you know, because then finally I asked the guy, like, I can't, I said, hey, I just told you last night how I play here all the time, this is the spot I regularly play, and boom, you're here the very next night, you're hitting this spot, like, you're, so he says, hey, yeah, yeah, too tough, not your, you know, hey, I, I, it's public, it's public space, I can play here if I want, and he is right, so I'm like, yikes, so, jeez, thanks, dude, so, um, anyways, uh, Boom, here comes the security guard. I wish I could remember the guy's name. 
Lester or something. I don't know. You know, and Ch- Charles. <laughs> the guys like, hey, Tony, what's what's going on? You not? How come you're not playing tonight? And I just motion with my eyes like this guy over here. You know, to the harmonica guy. He's playing harmonica. He says, "Sir, excuse me, sir, excuse me." He stops and plays. Do you do you have permission to play here? The guy's like, what? The permission? What do you mean? <laughs> looking at me like, what do you mean permission? Like a letter from the, the you know from the owners to perform in this property? Uh, no, I don't. Well, he does, so you can't play here. This is his spot. Boom! <laughs> Great story. Sorry to say to the guy, hey. I just shake my hands. I say, hey, hey, what are you gonna do? Sorry, man. You yeah, know, too bad. Bummer. So, guy had a guy had to go. Uh, guy had to go hoof it, stick out a new claim somewhere else. I said, it was great. So, another little quick story from Austin, Texas. Join me for one more short segment. Uh, another Busker's Tale after this. <laughs> Okay, welcome back, and thank you. And I'll buy, uh, we'll just end it with uh, another story here, cap off this uh, episode here of selling artwork door-to-door in Malibu, Bob Dylan's house, and more Busker's Tales from Austin, Texas here with this story of uh, one night I'm out here in Austin in uh, 95. Um, I want to say it's uh, sometime in uh, early May, late April, and I'm giving it up. I'm playing my heart out. I'm doing everything I can. And I think it was around this time I got a sponsorship from Lee Oscar Harmonicas. Fantastic. Uh, get on the, the preferred player program, getting harmonicas right from the factory in Bellingham, Washington. It was wonderful. The, at the time, his wife Lee and Leslie Oscar, they were so supportive and just fantastic. So I'm totally energized and pumped. I'm playing my heart out, and there's just nothing happening. I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, People are just walking by. I'm like a statue, though I'm uh, playing everything I can. I'm pulling out all my tricks. I'm In my first 10 minutes, I've probably just, you know, tried everything I can. Nothing. The harder I tried, the less reaction I got. Uh, this is the street, this is it, you're feeling something psychic here, you're picking it up, you're going, uh, intuition with the universe, what's going on, what's going wrong, what's going right, what am I doing, what should I not do, what should I maybe try doing, so, I'm doing it, everything, I can't, nobody's stopping, this is unbelievable, and I think it's just a lack of votes to begin with, always about, like, a good uh, a lesson for you uh, street performers there to, you know, always throw a little seed money in there, you know, when you start, uh, because uh, uh, the people don't see anything in the case, they think this guy's no good, he's got no votes at all in there, there's just nothing happening, and so... Then the more votes that click in, the more people throw in more votes because they're like, well, this guy is good. Let's boom. Look at that. He's just so unbelievably. Sometimes you got to clear it out because it's a little too many votes. Like maybe, hey, let's not gloat. So anyways, um, I'm doing everything I can. I'm not getting any votes. I, I don't think I had any money to seed my case. I'm probably, you know, just squirreled every penny away for an apartment so I could you know, get get moving and so I think I had moved that month, was getting ready to move that month into the place. So I remember that um it was it, the there was nobody stopping on the whole time I was out there. I'm out like an hour now. So probably about thirty minutes into this hour of no one stopping, this the only thing that happens is this man walks up, all in black, Texas gentleman, boots, cowboy, black, black jeans, black shirt, black hair, brown hair, black, black I think, so, 
This guy's a real character. Uh, he's leaning against a brick planter like t- 10 to 15 feet in front of me, leaning on the planter, intently listening to me, just wailing away on the harmonica and singing damn near every song I, I could, you know, but usually going through hours of playing, I cover a pretty big set list, so maybe even repeat some of the better, stronger tunes <coughs> towards the end. So, anyways, I'm giving it all my all, and there's just nothing happening. I'm not going anywhere, and this guy in black is just sitting there, shaking his head. Like, I have this guy. He's my sole fan supporter. He hasn't tipped me or anything, but he's just there listening, which is more than I'm getting. I'm appreciating because I'm feeling like I'm a statue, and nobody's paying any attention, and this guy is just like, awestruck looking at me thinking wow I could tell like I'm really trying here and just coming up goose egg as they say so anyways after he listens for what seemed like to almost t- over t- between 20 and 30 minutes a long time you know for a person to stop and listen to a street performer he 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 walked over and he dropped 20 dollars in my case and he said incredible that's all he said. Incredible. Incredible. Can't believe people aren't stopping or something. He said, that. I said, I know. Like, meanwhile, this guy has just righted the cart, you know, where that was probably all these tips I wasn't getting in the last hour and a half. And this guy just, boom, just caught me up right there. Like that one tip. Boom. I up. Fantastic. Shake the guy's hand. He says, yeah. I said, Dude, thank you so much. I said, what, what's your name? He says, my name's Robert. I say, uh, oh, he's walking away. I say, what do you do? And he says, I play guitar. Have a great night. You know, something like that. He's Then he's gone down the road. So I think, wow, this is fantastic. So a month later, I'm at the Kerrville Folk Festival for the first time, the 25th anniversary. I'm in the audience in the main stage pavilion performance. And on stage is Robert, Robert Earl Keen. He had tipped me twenty dollars. Is performing on stage at the Kerrville Folk Festival, and that was my introduction to Robert O'Keen's music and who he was, and making that connection. And I don't think I went and tracked him down and said, "Hey, how's that guy?" I just, just didn't go there. Just was busy running around the ranch. I don't know. I just left. But, uh, anyways, thanks a lot. That was just another quick tale there, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this podcast uh, episode two. And be sure to visit. Uh, cabin-podcast.com that's a website for the podcast and also has a social media links at the bottom a long uh, really detailed descriptive biography of me your host there Tony Anderson aka Fast Tony and please be sure to find me on all uh, major uh, media platforms streaming services Spotify Apple Music Tidal Amazon and please search uh, Tony Anderson, Blanket of Stars, or Tony Anderson, Sierra Cabin Recordings, Tony Anderson, Fast Tony Collection, Tony Anderson, By Road Rail, Sky and Sail, etc. You can find my music out there. The track that you've been hearing uh, is an instrumental to a song of mine called Bombs Away that is on the Sierra Cabin Recordings. Feel free to search for that as well and check it out. And uh, join me soon for some of the interviews coming up. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you tuning in. Have a great uh, day. Evening. Down to the discount, the begging man did say. As the bottom touched his lips, he pushed the past. Far away, gone like a spider, like a little jet fighter. He just hit for the sky, set bombs away like a salty candy. Sing Leon Russell, breaking free from the chains of the nine to five hustle. I stopped the rip off. Every chance that I can take.